freedom, freedom. Our prayers is answered. We is free. This is the joyous chorus heard throughout the South when the war was over and the formerly enslaved took a breath of freedom air. Lord of mercy, I live to be free. Don't know where to turn, just jumping up and down for joy. Then the master said, go take care of yourself. We don't have no money. How are we going to take care of ourselves? I, Lula Wilson in Texas, from 97 years old and blind, taken to my bed. I told them my story of the hard slavery days. William Green, I was 87, and I members with Major Montgomery brought us from Mississippi to Texas, and I run away. Yes, sir. I'm James Boyd, and I was 100 when I told my story. Them slavers was some bad people. Many formerly enslaved sailed to New Heights with education, economic successes, and reunification with their families. Most did not fare so well. Reconstruction was too short and inadequate to repair centuries of harm from slavery. Frederick Douglass understood that freedom could not be maintained without economic resources. He said, The Egyptian bondsman went out with the spoils of his master, and the Russian serf was provided with farming tools and three acres of land upon which to begin life. But the Negro had neither spoils, implements, or lands, and today he is practically a slave on the very plantation where formerly he was driven to toil under the lash. Carter G. Woodson wrote, The poverty which afflicted them for a generation after emancipation held them down to the lowest order of society nominally free, but economically enslaved. According to historian Mary Frances Berry, by 1899, about 21% of the black population nationally had been born into slavery. What if America had agreed to compensate freed persons just a little for their contribution to this country, like they were doing for war veterans and widows. Pay the freed person age 70 and older $500 and $15 a month. Those 60 to 69 would receive $300 and $12 a month. Those age 50 to 59 would receive $100 and $8 a month, and those under 50 would receive $4 a month for the rest of their life. Imagine what a difference this would have made in repairing those years of slavery. Some Americans of goodwill were determined that freed persons should receive more than schools, but across the board money and land for years of unpaid labor. On March 11, 1867, House Speaker Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania introduced Bill H.R. 29, outlining a plan to distribute land to former slaves. To each male person, who is head of household, 40 acres. To each male, whether the head of the family or not, 40 acres. To each widow who is head of the family, 40 acres. Stevens was honest enough and insightful enough to know if federal land redistribution legislation failed to pass, freed people would be at the whim of former slaveholders for years to come. He said, 
withhold from them all their rights and leave them destitute of the means of earning a livelihood, and they will become the victims of the hatred of the rebels whom they helped to conquer. It did not pass, but what if? Introducing Walter R. Vaughn, born in Selma, Alabama. He believed that pensions to former slaves would provide increased economic vitality and stability to the New South. In 1891, he published a pamphlet entitled Freedmen's Pension Bill, a plea for American freedmen, and sold copies at a dollar apiece. Vaughn lived in Omaha, Nebraska, and persuaded his congressman, William James Connell, to introduce the measure to the House of Representatives in 1890. It failed to pass. Among those selling Vaughn's pamphlet was Isaiah Dickerson of Rutherford County, Tennessee. A few years later, he would be instrumental in establishing an organization to compensate freed persons for unpaid labor during slavery. Several organizations were founded to push for slavery pensions. Perhaps the best known was the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief, Bounty, and Pension Association of the United States of America. It was chartered on August 7, 1897, with the dual mission to petition Congress for passage of legislation to compensate ex-slaves and to provide them mutual aid and burial expenses. The association's headquarters was in Nashville, Tennessee, where two of its most notable leaders, who were former slaves, Isaiah H. Dickerson and Callie D. House, resided. Dickerson was an educator and minister. He was the general manager and national promoter of the organization. House, a widow, laundress, and mother of five, was elected as the assistant secretary of the association in November 1898. She soon became a national promoter of the movement alongside Dickerson. Members paid a fee to defray lobbying costs, printing, and publication, as well as travel expenses for national officers. Monthly dues supported the mutual aid services that included helping the sick, disabled, and for burial expenses. By the late 1890s, this was the premier ex-slave pension organization, claiming a membership in the hundreds of thousands, with local chapters mostly located in the South and Midwest. They were well organized and held annual conventions. Such a good and fair plan for what they were obviously do. There is hope in knowing American history. Learn it and know who we are. Please subscribe to ASV History and support more informative stories of great and resilient Americans.